and are both religious parishioners. Today in the village of Sunday. There's an unmistakable emphasis on practicing this crucial virtue. We read in the introit, when I cried to the Lord, he heard my voice from them that draw near to me, and he humbled them. In the collect, God, who does chiefly manifest thy power and forbearance and mercy, multiply upon us thy pity. And why would we need any mercy if we weren't sinners that need to humble ourselves? So we can see humility present in today's collect, even though it's not mentioned by name. And then St. Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians that no one has it all. No one's got all the answers, all the talents, all the abilities. He explains so beautifully how the Holy Ghost gives this gift or gifts to this person, these gifts to that person, these gifts to another person, and so on and so forth. So that's a reminder as far as ability is concerned. Recognize when we don't have a rule play or a talent or an ability, we have to humbly admit that. And then in the gospel, we're told not to be like that Pharisee who trusted in himself, who was so filled with himself that all he could do was thank God for a great need for sequence. And he made it a point to say, to God because he was priding himself on what he had or what he perceived himself to have over the public and the public was kept saying that mercy of the Lord God that's the one that was pleasing to God so what is this virtue of humility that is so important I wouldn't say it's the most important one overall. I think faithful and charity, the three theological virtues, are the most important, the greatest virtues of all. But humility is like the foundation of a house. What if you try to build a house without concrete footings? What would that house be like? It would be very shaky at best. And it would be doomed to fall down because the ground has it moves around, it has give, it washes away. So that's what happens in our spiritual life without humility. In our how our spiritual house will collapse. Humility is the foundation. Everything else gets built on top of that. And there are many virtues, or rather many sayings in Scripture, how God detests those who lack humility, those who pride themselves. God resists the proud and gives his grace to the humble. That's one of the several sayings of more. So we need to humble ourselves before God. We need to be like this public. Not to go and sin like the public, but to repent like the public. You know what's so amazing in this regard is the one who exceeded of all other saints, everybody else in humility, is our blessed mother. And yet she never sinned. She had no reason to say, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner, because she never committed the least sin in her life. So how was she able to be more humble than all of us put together? Because she recognized that she was a creature. The greatest of God's creatures, but still a creature, and she submitted and she obeyed God. That's what was so pleasing to God. When God sees a creature acknowledging his or her place, in the case 
all said in good faith. He said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to God opens eyes and blesses and pops it up. I'm reminded of something St. Teresa of Avila said that whenever she humbled herself the most, that's when God heard her prayers more effectually, you might say, or more fully. She had to work at moving out pride in herself. Everybody does. It's one of the hardest things because so often we don't even see our pride. So acts of humility, accepting humiliations when they happen. As Father Clement Loomis used to say, no humility without humiliations. Other than humiliations, you know, the love ups that we have, the mistakes we make, or something's brought to our attention we need to correct, or you know, things like that. Those are hard to take. But those are great opportunities to grow in humility. And again, the more humility we have, the more pleasing we are to God. Humility is also shown by obedience, by submission to proper authority. Submitting to the church. We live in an area in an age where there's a tremendous amount of picking and choosing what a person wants to believe in. That's not about submission at all. That's just saying, if I like that doctrine, I'll accept it. If I don't like it, I'll reject it. That is pure pride. You see, we don't, we don't accept the teachings of the church necessarily because they make perfect sense to us. We accept them because the church is the infallible guide. You see, and God gave to the church the authority to teach us, to rule us. Now, granted, we live in an age where we can separate ourselves from heretics, and by the way, I remind you that historically this was always the correct and necessary thing to do. For example, when the Arian heresy broke down, most of the bishops became Arian heretics. One estimate is eight out of ten. And Catholics did the right thing by separating from those heretics. They may still have been in possession of physical churches or, you know, structures. But the church has always said, separate yourself from heresy. They lost their authority as a matter of fact. And teaching that it's false heresy. But apart from that, we submit to the church. We know the church itself cannot fail. And so we submit to the church, and even though we don't have them the receiving living authorities, the teaching guide us. We look at them that in 19 and a half centuries of all the teachings of the church, this marvelous, consistent body of truths, it all works together. And we strive in the virtue of humility to say, I submit, I accept, I believe. Church teaches me. Remember, the church doesn't have authority in all matters. The church has no authority over, say, mathematics, economics, forestry, science, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you, you, you name it, uh, uh, accounting. But where the church does have authority is in faith and morals. This is a specific mission that our Lord gave to his church, and she's faithfully exercised it through the centuries. In spiritual matters, the church has that supreme authority. We must not try to say, well, I don't understand it, or I find it too hard. I think it was Chesterton who put it so well. He says, One of my greatest need is not to have a church tell me that I'm right when I'm right. I need the church to tell me when I'm wrong, I'm wrong when I think I'm right. Again, we're not in power. The 
church is. And yet we see that as all those persistent teachings there through the centuries, and it is humility to say, I believe, I follow that, I submit. It may, I may not understand that. As a matter of fact, there are things, mysteries of our faith that are beyond our comprehension. We'll never understand, for example, the Holy Trinity or the real presence of our Lord, how bread and wine becomes the blue body and blood. Our senses see no change at all. And we say, I humbly adore my Lord and God as he comes down on the altar, even though there's a little visible change. Again, we have the example of our lesson of she who had no sin and yet was so humble, so pleasing. And when God visited her and said for the incarnation, her words are the words that we should strive to say in our own lives. Behold, I have made you a behold. Be it done to me according to thy will. Obedience is always proof of humility. I'm reminded of the story of a, a, a very unusual saint. I think he was around the fourth century. His name was Saint Simon Stylites. He was called Stylites because he literally lived at the top of a pillar. Stylus is the Greek and black word for the column or pillar. And this is truly amazing. It's one of the things called Titus. But he was called in a very unique life. He was living as a hermit, and he, you know, the, the food and water would be brought up and I, every few days. He, you know, the charitable people who would provide food and water and they pull it up on their own. And probably only had like a uh, four by four, four by six platform at the top of this pillar. And he stood there all the time. He was up there for years, praising God, living in tremendous union with God. Well, anyway, as the story goes, one of the uh, some of the nearby abbots became very concerned about Simon. They said that is unusual. Even back then, and he said, "This is just not normal. People just don't do these things." We think. And he's just living into his pride, it's living that, you know, that uh, very unique, singular lifestyle. He just wants to stand out from everybody. Let's put him to a test. And these habits, I think they were well motivated and concerned for his soul. They, they decided to approach him one day. There he is out in the desert, he's on his site top of his pillar living as he did. And they called up to him and said, we think that you should leave that pillar. We think that you, you should just come down and join the rest of us monks. And Simon being a very holy and humble man and obedient man that he was, he saw that as something to submit to. So he started to come down the pillar of my own gate. He had a prideful reaction. Who do you think you are telling me that, you know, what I should be doing? He started it and done it right away. And as soon as those abbots saw that, they said, Simon, stay. We just wanted to see if this was truly virtuous. And we didn't see the way he reacted. You are truly living a holy life. Stay there. Stay where you are. So again, obedience is the proof of humility. Let us pray for the humility in our lives. And again, our models, well, ultimate models, our Lord Jesus Christ, he who humbled himself to the death of the cross. That's the exact phrase. 
St. Paul, humble yourself to the death of the cross. Uh, it's human nature of suffering the worst death. That's infinite humility here. But after you have our blessed love, be bold and wait on the Lord. Let us strive to have that humble spirit of obedience to Holy Mother Church's teachings. The ones that have traditionally always been there. That will be a sure God, a sure proof that we are striving to love God and to submit to Him, practicing that as virtue of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost.